Okay. Well, John is okay. one of our longtime volunteers and board members, and he's here to talk about the exciting new black hole image that was recently released. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm the warm up act. We've been doing this almost two years now. A little news piece before the main speaker. So the big news that everyone's heard about is the black hole. This is pretty hot. Move it down a little bit. Black hole image made in a galaxy called M87. And this is the first direct image of a black hole. And you guys are great. Thank you very much. I, I, I paid a few people to see that. <laughs> so, of course, the internet went crazy and did the Eye of Sauron from you know, things like that. But I will not do that here. This is... So, a little bit of uh, background on this image. It was announced April 10th. This is the shadow of the accretion disk made by the black hole. The black hole itself is not giving off light that you can see, but the material falling in and heating up to tremendous temperatures is. And then the light has to make it around this area close to the black hole where space and time are twisted out of it. Uh, anything that feels intuitive to us. And you get this unusual image here. Uh, this is the largest black hole in angular size, so how it looks to observers on Earth. Um, larger than Pluto's orbit in space is the, uh, the event horizon of the black hole. Uh, in our sky, it's 42 micro arc seconds across. So if you put your pinky finger up and in there, like it's some look with one eye, that's one degree across. So now divide that into, that's the moon is, the full moon is half of that. I know it doesn't seem possible, but divide that into 60 little slices and you've got arc minutes. Divide each of those into 60 slices and you've got arc seconds. These are 42 micro arc seconds. So this is a very tiny image uh, they've been able to pull out. So it took a very large telescope to make an image of a spot in the sky this small. And we'll see how that's done in just a second. This weighs in at about you know, roughly 6.5 billion solar masses, the mass of our sun. Sagittarius A is the black hole in the middle of our galaxy, and it's only 4 million solar masses. It's just a wimp. Um, this is 55 million light years away, though, where our central black hole is about 25,000 light years away. Um, we use what's called the millimeter uh, part of the radio frequency spectrum, or VHF in the olden days, uh, to look at this. And this is an artist's image. This was actually using the equations of general relativity in a computer simulation using an awful lot of uh, video cards for computation power. This was made for the movie Interstellar. And what's really neat is this mathematical model has a lot of very similar features here. We got stuff off to the side, a little bit of glow down there. So, looks like uh, Einstein might have been right about something. <laughs> so here's the Event Horizon Telescope that made this initial image possible, and there's a lot more to come. They're still working hard on this. Used it radio telescopes across the world, linked together, combining their data. And it was a mathematical and technological feat to pull this off, which I'm not going to get into because we don't have time. So uh, what this did is it showed that if you want to know how big a black hole is, looking at stars going around the black hole, they're a pretty good indication of how fast they go around it. We looked at gas blobs and how that behaved around black holes, and we got very wrong answers for black hole masses. We found that the black hole in M87 is rotating about once every three to maybe 60 days. That's about as close as we can narrow it down. Uh, these are the stars going around our central black hole. So now we're a little more, you know, turn the volume down. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so this is what makes that strange shadow. These are all different light rays coming in 
just happening to, happening to pass near the black hole from whatever source, be it the accretion disk or the stars around. And from our point of view, way off to the right, we see this bright uh, couple bands in a sort of a donut shape all the way around it with a dimmer center and dimmer around the edges. So this is what M87 might look like in a good backyard telescope or long uh, exposure image, nice little galaxy. Uh, here it is in the optical. Up close from the Hubble, you can see a little jet coming out of it. That's from the black hole. The material spiraling in some of it gets accelerated and magnetic field uh, of the uh, black hole pumps that out uh, in the north and south jets that are traveling out near the speed of light. In radio uh, frequencies, you can see the jet coming out another lobe over here. In x-ray you can see all the gases that are heated to unbelievable temperatures giving off some of the highest uh, frequency light. Uh, we didn't, because it's such a large black hole, it didn't change much over time. So here are images from April 5th, April 6th, April 10th. I think this is 2017. Yeah, 2017. Yeah, I got that right. <laughs> I should read my own slide. Uh, they had four different teams working independently, not sharing data, not talking to each other while they made their own images of the uh, black hole region. And you can see they all got very similar results. So that uh, gave confidence to their discovery. Uh, they have synthetic data. This is a computer simulation on the left, given all the conditions involved. And on the right, this is all data from uh, with different masks and mathematical filters put on it. And that works pretty well. It really is using what we understand of physics. That's what we would have expect to see. Some astronomers are sad about that because if it was really different, then there's more job security to figure out why. <laughs> so. so what's the future for this telescope? Well, they got lucky with eight of the sites uh, in 2017. They had bad weather in 2018, and then they had technical difficulties. So they've canceled the 2019 ooh, observing run. Um, good news is they're going to add more telescopes in 2020. They're going to have the Greenland Telescope, the Kitt Peak National Observatory, and Northern Extended Millimeter Array, and the French Alps jump in. They'll turn me down a little bit more here. Um, yeah, I did the site testing for uh, Kid Peak, so I lived in a tent for a couple summers doing measurements on what the sky was like out there. They're also going to look at polarization, so how the light comes in rotating one way or another, or whether it's horizontal or vertically oriented, and that's going to give more information around it. They'll get a higher resolution, and hopefully they'll be able to see how the jet is created from the accretion disk area. They're going to use shorter wavelengths to pull that off. And they want to get an image of our own black hole. Once they get good at this biggest one in our sky, then we're going to try to go to something a little smaller in our sky. So I'm going to end with a little animation to show you where this is and how big it is in the sky. And then I'll leave you a link. So if you really want to read the original paper, it will be up here. So near Virgo and Leo. Forty two micro arc seconds. It's not much. There's the jet coming out in the visible. Switching to I think infrared then radio. Not dramatic or anything. <laughs> Alright, there you go. A little, I made a little bitly there, which is a little easier to do than all that up there. Those are the same links. Alright, we'll switch over to our, our speaker for this evening. Give us a moment to change gears.
Southwest Research Institute, which is in Boulder, and he's been with Southwest for about 15 years. We overlapped a bit as colleagues, and he has worked on some of the most interesting and exciting planetary missions around. So John's background is that he started out in England and at the University of Cambridge as a geologist, along with one of his friends. So <laughs> geology is very cool. <laughs> he got his PhD from the University of Arizona. And he has worked at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Currently, he is a deputy project scientist for the New Horizons mission, which is based out of the Southwest Research Institute, and which flew by Pluto. And we've had John here many times, uh, talking both before and after the Pluto flyby. Um, he's also been here talking about the Cassini mission to Saturn and all the exciting results from the moon Enceladus, and he is also a part of the Lucy mission to study the Trojan asteroids. So we're happy to have you back. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the furthest encounter, the most distant object ever reached by a uh, a spacecraft from Earth, and uh, this is this funny looking object. This is an artist's impression before we got there. I'll show you the real thing later. But way out. Let me try that again. Give me a sec. Okay, let's, I'll, I'll try not to make any sudden movements. Um, <laughs> um, so we're, uh, this is an object on the edge of our solar system, the first time we've seen an object, anything like this, uh, that class of objects so far from the sun, so it's been an exciting part of this mission. Um, but first I want to tell you some of the background about the mission and what was our main target, which was Pluto. So here is our spacecraft, the New Horizons spacecraft, being assembled uh, sometime in 2005. Um, and you can see the, the technicians here in the foreground. Um, this is not a big spacecraft. It would, it would fit comfortably at the front of this room. Um, and, but it's, it's really powerful, really fast spacecraft. One reason we made it so small is because it could then be sent off at very high speed and get to Pluto while we were still alive, so that was good. Um, but it's bristling with, with scientific instruments. There's, uh, giving you a quick tour, the radio dish, this week is what we use to send the data back to Earth, uh, but it also has, uh, does science with the radio beam, it can measure Pluto's atmosphere and it measures the temperatures of objects, including our target, Ultima Thule. Um, we have a couple of plasma instruments here that measure the solar wind and how that was affected by Pluto. We have, be hiding behind the lens cap here is LORI, which is a, our telephoto camera, which takes super detailed, uh, high resolution images in black and white. Um, underneath the bottom of it here, which faces forward as it's flying through the solar system, is a dust counter that was built by students at the University of Colorado down in Boulder. And uh, that no, whenever interplanetary dust particles hit the spacecraft, it, it can register those and map those through the solar system. And then here's our uh, color camera here, Envic. This was actually built at Ball Aerospace in Boulder. Um, and that takes wide angle color pictures. LEAS is an infrared instrument that takes infrared spectra of the surface of whatever we're looking at to tell us what, what it's made of. Very powerful instrument. And then we have an ultraviolet instrument here called ALICE which uh, is mostly used to look at the ultraviolet light from atmospheres of Pluto and um, other things in the solar system. 
So we've got the whole radio, all the, the whole spectrum covered from the ultraviolet to the radio and really powerful instruments and we sending these off to the far reaches of the solar system we've been learn, able to learn amazing things. So here, if I can get this to work, is how the journey began. We have ignition and liftoff of NASA's New Horizons spacecraft on a decade voyage to visit the planet's planets and then beyond. So this was the biggest rocket that NASA had available at the time, and we had this little tiny spacecraft, it was like a hood ornament on the front of it. So that allowed us to get tremendous speeds. It was the fastest uh, launch ever from Earth. Just listen to him. Yeah. Ah, that will work better, I think. Okay. I think I'm, I may have it done better now. So this was our mission. Oops. No. Nope. <laughs> it was it was an exciting. Uh, uh, encounter anyway. We, I mean, a, a launch. We, uh, we were all out there cheering it on. Um, yeah. Um, the total cost of the of the the mission, including the launch vehicle and everything, about three quarters of a billion dollars, seven hundred and fifty million, which is a lot, but it's like a cappuccino for everyone in the U.S. Um, for a, you know a few years. So we 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 thank you all for the cappuccinos. Um, so this was our mission. We launched uh, January 2006, uh, as you just saw, and then it took us only a year. The speed we were going was amazing to get to Jupiter. Um, and we, we flew by Jupiter to get a little bit of extra gravitational boost from Jupiter to, slow, to speed us up on our way to Pluto. And then it was pretty much a straight shot all the way out through the outer solar system, not passing anywhere else on the way out to Pluto in July 2015 and so we had an amazing flyby of Pluto in the middle of July and then on into the Kuiper Belt which I'll be talking about later this vast swarm of small objects that orbit the Sun beyond Neptune and Pl of which Pluto is the largest we object that we know about um, so yeah first stop was Jupiter um, and we we flew past um, in the end of February, uh, right at my 50th birthday, actually. Um, and uh, this is a picture of Jupiter that we took with our infrared camera. There's the red spot, and it doesn't look red because it's infrared. Um, and, but the main purpose to going to Jupiter was just to get that gravity boost. But we were able to look at Jupiter uh, with our instruments, and it was a great way to check out our instruments and our spacecraft and actually practice on a real target. Uh, one of my favorite uh, places in the solar system is actually Jupiter's moon Io. And these are pictures of, of Io with the different instruments to give you a feel for what the different instruments can see. Um, Io is an amazing place. It's got active volcanoes. And uh, so here it is. You see the crescent of Io. It's about the same size as our moon, but nothing like our moon otherwise. What you're seeing here, this bright spot, is a, the glow of, a, of lava on the surface and this is a huge cloud of debris that's blasted up from the volcano that's making that lava glow. Um, and you can see mountains here on the day-night boundary here. This is, so that's Laurie, our telephoto black and white camera. Our color wide angle camera, you can now see that that, that volcano is glowing red, just as volcanoes should. But the cloud of debris that's coming out, it's very fine particles like smoke, so it glows blue. And then this is our infrared view. It's not quite as sharp, but now you can see the heat radiation from a, a nearly a dozen other volcanoes on the night side of Io, all glowing and being picked up by our infrared instrument. So we see different views, but very, get very complementary information from these different instruments. Question. Yeah? Is the heat of those volcanoes comparable to the heat of the volcanoes on Earth? Um, much greater. The temperatures are similar, though they may be a bit hotter, but. Um, it has 100 times as many active volcanoes as the Earth does. It, there's one volcano that puts like, out about half as much heat as the entire planet Earth. So it's, it's incredibly an incredible place. We'd love to send a mission there to, sometime too. Yes? To get the uh, pictures, either visual or spectral or whatever, 
Does New Horizon actually move focus the camera in the direction, or do you wait for it to come into view? Oh, it yeah, the, the cameras are all bolted onto the spacecraft, so they don't move independently. We can move the whole spacecraft. Pretty, it's pretty agile spacecraft. We can do uh, um, a 90 degree turn in about a minute and a half. So we can, we can point around the sky and, and point everything in the directions we want. And it's got little tiny, tiny thrusters that fire little jets of gas to turn it one way and then you fire another t jet to, to you stop it. From your iPhone? <laughs> <laughs> something, something like that, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we send up commands every uh, couple of weeks. We send up a new command load with its instructions for the next two weeks. And that's how we, we command it. Um, but it can take several hours for that command to actually get up there. Um, so from Jupiter, um, it was cool seeing all these amazing things at Jupiter, but lots of spacecraft had been to Jupiter before. We were going to where no one had been before. And so to get all the way to Pluto took a long time. <laughs> it took eight years, so you know, to while away the time, we had to, you know, had a, a cake every, at the anniversary of every launch. Uh, but we also had a lot of work to do because we were going to fly by Pluto in the matter of hours, um, years in the future, and we, the, it's four and a half hours at the speed of light to get a command to the spacecraft, four and a half hours to get information back. So you've got a nine hour gap. There's no way to joystick the spacecraft in real time. You've got to plan the whole encounter, every single exposure, uh, everywhere you're going to point the spacecraft, all those details in advance. And so we spent years planning out every minute of that flyby to get the most out of it. And, you know, we're using high-tech computer simulations and low-tech wooden sticks to do this. <laughs> uh, but we ended up with a really nice plan, and by early 2015, we were approaching Pluto, and we could start to execute that plan and, and see what Pluto was like. And um, this is just in our workroom. Someone had made a nice montage of Pluto getting bigger. This is probably early May, and then this is probably middle of June. We're heading towards the July 14 flyby, and it was just absolutely riveting. Every day you get a new picture in and see more and more detail. Pluto is rotating. This is, these are images are taken six days apart, so between these you're seeing other sides of Pluto as it rotates as well. Um, it's just an incredibly exciting time. And then we, we came the day after the flyby, which went successfully, the images starting coming down, and uh, Everyone was waiting for the images to appear on the hard drive and hitting refresh as fast as possible. And I hit refresh at just the right moment, so it came up on my screen first. <laughs> so everyone's gathering around to, to see what Pluto looked like for the first time. And just that one image showed us nothing that we could possibly have imagined in advance. So it was an exciting moment. Oh, the, this was at um, the Applied Physics Lab in uh, Maryland. So the, a lot of the mission planning was done here, and the mission is run from here. Alan Stern, who's the uh, principal investigator, he's based here in Baldwin. In fact, he founded our office. Um, but the, the engineers are mostly at the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland. It's part of Johns Hopkins University. And they built the spacecraft there. So we were operating the spacecraft just you know, a few hundred yards from where it had been built, which was cool. Um, and so here's Pluto in all its glory. Um, just an incredibly spectacular place. Um, I will, yeah, that's good. <laughs> some, extremely, some extremely dark regions. Uh, and some bright, this is a vast, I'll show you closer up pictures in a minute. This is a vast nitrogen glacier. It's so cold on Pluto that the, the atmosphere is made of nitrogen like most of the air that we're, we're breathing here. But it's so cold, most of it's frozen out on the surface, and most of it's collected in the lowest spot, which is this basin here. And so this is a nitrogen glacier. And these are mountains made of methane, and this is some sort of organic, tarry hydrocarbon stuff. Uh, huge mountains here, the height of the Rocky Mountains. Um, and all in beautiful color, thanks to our color camera from Ball Aerospace. And so this is a computer-generated movie uh, made purely from data from the spacecraft of what it would be like to fly over the surface of Pluto. These are all details that the spacecraft saw, just all nicely animated. 
So you can see these big mountains. On, this is the nitrogen glacier here and that very dark red region. Um, and yeah, to give you a scale, this is pretty much like the front range in Colorado and here would be Denver and we're up here somewhere. <laughs> um, but these mountains, which are like the size of Long's Peak, are made of water ice. They're not essentially huge icebergs floating in the nitrogen ice because nitrogen ice is actually heavy enough to float water ice. And so, and you see these weird patterns here, like a lava lamp patterns. This is actually, the nitrogen is convecting. Uh, it's bubbling up and cooling off and then sinking down again in this continuous motion that we think produces a lot of the geology we see here. So Pluto is just an incredibly spectacular and fascinating place. And we, we could measure the composition of all these areas with our infrared red instruments. So we know that this is mostly covered in methane snow and this is mostly nitrogen with some carbon monoxide and this is hydrocarbons and so on. And Pluto has a big moon, um, which, there we go, is Charon, which is a completely different place, but also an amazing place. It's about half the size of Pluto. Um, and you can see some very rugged terrain up here and then some kind of smoother area here that's still got mountains poking up through it and lots of craters. So this is all very ancient. Uh, Sharon isn't big enough to keep much heat, so the surface is very old. Um, but is, we think this is a vast fl flood of ammonia water mixture that may probably erupted on the surface about four billion years ago. And this is the North Pole. And Normally you expect poles to be bright and have, you have I polar ice caps. On Charon, the, ice is, the poles are dark and we think this is actually <coughs> hydrocarbons from Pluto that have collected in the poles where it's colder. Having escaped Pluto, they got trapped on Charon. Um, and we, call, we, we have had fun naming things. We call this Mordor Macula up here. <laughs> and this is Vulcan Plan. Um, there's lots of science fiction and fantasy names on. Or this, this might be Skywalker Crater. <laughs> so we had Pluto. Pluto was fascinating, but we had to bid it farewell and keep speeding on beyond. This is one of our favorite views. This is not a computer simulation. This is a real picture taken by the spacecraft looking back as we were pulling away from Pluto, heading out to the dark side. And now you see the nitrogen glacier and these mountains. And yeah, this is pretty much theirs. You know, that's kind of a long peak size yeah. mountain, and this is the front range here. Um, so a weirdly familiar landscape. And then we have the, the, the atmosphere just filling the sky here. Very thin, but a very deep atmosphere. Because the gravity is so low, the ex atmosphere extends a long way off the surface. But yeah, this is everyone's favorite picture of Pluto. And as we pulled away, uh, we just see this blue rain. The, the haze in Pluto's atmosphere is blue. And we just saw this blue ring disappearing into the distance as we headed out for, to explore further. It actually isn't. It looks like it. But the sun is not behind Pluto. It's over here somewhere. Uh, but the atmosphere extends so high that you can see the sunlit atmosphere all the way around on the night side, which you wouldn't see on the Earth because the Earth's atmosphere, the Earth's gravity is so much higher that the atmosphere is scrunched in close to the surface and you don't see the light from around the dark side. But on Pluto you do. Um, but another beautiful picture. So yeah, then we were, we were heading out uh, from Pluto out into the Kuiper Belt into this region which we only knew existed about, um, what would it be now, nearly 30 years ago. The first objects other than Pluto beyond Neptune was, were found out here and we rapidly realized there were hundreds of thousands of small worlds in addition to a few quite big ones like Pluto out here. <coughs> And we wanted to know what the rest of them were like. Pluto is, a, is an oddball. It's an amazing place, but it's not representative of what's out there. We wanted to see the typical stuff. And when, but when we launched, we knew we were heading out into this cloud of stuff, but we hadn't actually identified one object that we could go see. And so, but we, we did the math and we said, yeah, there's probably something out there that we'll be able to fly by. No problem. <laughs> um, and we convinced NASA of that anyway. But then we actually had to find the darn thing. Um, so starting in 2011, we had a big campaign uh, using some of the world's biggest telescopes with some of the biggest cameras. This is the Subaru telescope in Hawaii. 
this is the Magellan Telescope in Chile. Those are our two work workhorses. Um, and they were surveying the part of the sky where we needed to look. Um, and we had a big problem because the part of the sky we had to look in to find these incredibly faint moving objects that we might be able to target with the spacecraft was right in the middle of the Milky Way in Sagittarius, which is the densest star clouds in the entire sky. And that's where we had to search. We had to look for tiny moving objects against millions of stars that were thousands of times brighter. And so we found dozens of objects. We didn't find any that were close enough to the spacecraft to reach. And so this was rather frustrating. We were getting kind of nervous. We're going to be on Pluto and we'll have nowhere to go. Um, I should say that the spacecraft, uh, you go back to this view, and it looks like you, know, you couldn't miss. You'd run into something if you weren't careful. But in reality, space is so big out here, and these objects are so small that there are a million miles between them. And uh, the spacecraft has enough fuel to just tilt its trajectory by about half a degree. So we're pretty much heading in a straight line, and we can just nudge a little bit to one side or the other. So if something else is over here, forget it. It has to be right along our line of, of trajectory. So we, uh, we had to call out the big guns at that point. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, is a better uh, tool for finding objects out there. Not because it's a bigger telescope, because it's not that as big as those ground-based telescopes, but it takes incredibly sharp images. So it can see between that bla those blaze of stars to the dark space between them and pick up those moving objects. So we had an interesting time in the spring of 2014. We wrote a proposal. We requested 12 days of Hubble time, which is an enormous amount of time on this incredibly valuable asset. It was hard to get that much time. Um, we had to do a little arm twisting. Um, but they, they awarded us time June the 13th, 2014. Three days later, we started getting data. They, they really worked it out so they could hit the buttons, begin our program the moment they got an okay from the time allocation committee that they were going to give us the time. Um, and then they said, okay, you have to spend like just a few days of this time and you've got to find two objects. If you don't find that, we're not giving you the rest of the time. You've got to prove that you can do this. Um, and we found our first object uh, on June the 27th, so just 11 days after we started. Um, and then we found one more, so we qualified and we got the rest of the time and we breathed a sigh of relief. And then we had to track those through the summer. Um, and here is uh, my friend Mark Bowie, who lives just down, uh, down the way there, um, who was re the person who was doing the, the bulk of the heavy lifting to actually find objects in these thousands of images we were getting down from Hubble and all the thousands of stars in those images. Um, and on 11 days after we started, I got a phone call from him saying, you better come down and see what I got here. And this gives a feel for the, the scale of this. The Hubble has a rather small field of view. So this is the full moon. This is a, the, how much of the full moon you could get in one picture with Hubble. We wanted to cover an area about the size of the full moon. So we had to look at 80 different spots on the sky, tiled together like this, to have ho a hope of finding anything. Here is just one, one piece of one of those tiles here. And this is fairly scrunched down. You're not seeing all the details showing all the stars in it. Yeah. If you then look right here, <laughs> with the benefit of hindsight, there's a couple of stars. And here <coughs> is a moving object moving against a star background. This is kind of a time exposure or composite of them. Um, and this is what Mark found and what he called me down to his office to see. And Okay, it's in this picture. <laughs> this is just one of, the, one of the images we took. It's right in the center. And if I move, you'll see the stars moving. And this little thing here staying put because we're tracking on it. And the, on the basis of those five images of all the stars in that field, uh, he, he knew that we had an object and we could tell them that we could get more time. And then we just had to track that object through the summer. It was the, fir the first one we found, but we were tracking all of them to see where they were, if any of them were going to heading in our right direction. And uh, then got this email from one of our colleagues, Alex Parker, on August the 22nd, saying, you better sit down, because he'd, he'd done the latest determination of the orbit of that first object we found, number 11, 
and said, it looks like it's targetable. Um, in every version I've run, it produces a probability that this object is targetable of 100%. So we knew then we had somewhere to go. We had an object that was going to pass part close enough to the spacecraft um, trajectory that we, w we had enough fuel to divert ourselves so we could fly right by it. And uh, so here we were at Pluto. This is the orbit of this object. And this is now a pretty realistic view of where all those uh, Kuiper Belt objects are. The orange ones are a, a particular kind of object out there that are really special because they're orbiting in almost circular orbits, almost flat orbits. You may know Pluto has a kind of crazy orbit that's tilted and um, not very circular. In fact, this is Pluto's orbit here in this perspective. All these guys are just going around very flat and smooth and in the same direction. And they must have been doing that since the solar system formed because there's no way of getting them into that configuration later. So they have been undisturbed all that time. They spend all their time 40 times further from the sun than we are in deep freeze uh, without any kind of disturbance. So this is really pristine stuff. It's really the stuff the solar system was made of that's just been in cold storage out there all this time. And here is our object, which got an official name 2014 MU69. Um, and here it is right along our trajectory waiting for us to go see it. So just here beyond Pluto, we fired our engines. We had to fire them for several hours, actually. the low power thrusters and just nudged ourselves off on a, on a uh, rendezvous course with this, with this object. Um, that was in November 2015. And just by dumb coincidence, it turned out the flyby was going to be on New Year's Day 2019. For a while, we knew within a few hours when we were going to get there, but we didn't know which year we were going to arrive. So then on an accelerated process, we had like three, uh, really three years here um, between this point and this point with the unstoppable spacecraft to figure out the whole same process of what we're going to do when we get there, how close we were going to fly, which side we were going to fly on, all the observations we were going to take. Um, and that took over my life for the last three years because I was in charge of that process. So it was a, it was a really, a really fun, process really fascinating with amazing people we got to work with on this so yeah we had to decide how close we were going to fly it's a lot smaller than pluto pluto is um what is it it's about 1500 miles across this thing is about 20 miles across so we wanted to get a lot closer to it than we did to pluto but if we got too close our, our pictures would be blurry we wouldn't be able to point in the right direction so we had to find that sweet spot we do we plus fly behind the light, bright side where we, things are better illuminated or the dark side where we see more shadows and more topography, we had to decide that. And then just all the observations we had to make. We also had to figure out exactly where it was well enough to point at. The, one of the things that's terrifying about this spacecraft is it points blind. The spacecraft has no way of locking onto a target and saying, okay, it's right there, I'm going to aim my cameras right there. It's just saying, okay, the, the people on Earth told me to point this way, click. And you hope there's something in that, in that picture when you're looking through a, a field of view that's like smaller than it, looking through a drinking straw. And so knowing exactly where it was going to be and exactly where to point was a huge job. Um, we always wanted to make sure we weren't going to run into any debris when we got there. And all the little details of do we have enough storage space to stay, send, save, save all the images we want to take? Do we have enough power? Do we have enough fuel to do all the maneuvering and so on? And this is the plan we came up with in the end. Uh, this is about two hours in the lifetime of the spacecraft flying past the object which we nicknamed Ultima Thule because um, it didn't have enough names already. Um, um, it, we knew it was somewhere in this, along this blue line. So we had to point at every point from here to here as we went past and with infrared and then radio temperatures and color, infrared, color, black and white, and then looking back uh, temperature measurements of the night side as well and so on through the encounter so we got our plan ready and it was all ready to go and then we just had to get there and this was an exciting moment in in, in August um, that uh, we got our first images from the spacecraft we've been tracking it with Hubble but we'd only seen it with Hubble it's so faint you can't even see it with the biggest telescopes on the ground um, so we only had we could only see it with Hubble and, we'd, and then we'd seen its shadow passing in front of stars with some occultations, which is a whole other story. Um, and, but here was the first view from the spacecraft as we were heading towards it. And 
seeing it against the background of all these stars that we've had to remove to show it up. Yeah? Were you able to see the spacecraft from Hubble? No. Uh, we could barely see this object and it's 20 miles across. So something the size of this table, no hope. We could hear it from, hear it from our radio uh, dishes and that's all that we cared about. <laughs> yeah. And um, so uh, then we, we um, what was really gratifying about this, it, it, it first appeared in exactly the right pixel. So we knew we were heading in the right direction and uh, everything was where we were supposed to be and that was very reassuring. So then in uh, beginning of December, all the scientists gathered for the, um, for the encounter and we'd done a lot of practicing so we had to remember we weren't practicing this time. Um, and we had various jobs like figuring out the navigation of exactly where it was going to be and also figuring out whether it was dangerous around the area. We were looking for taking long exposure to see if there were any debris clouds or anything around this object that we didn't want to run into. And this is Mark Showalter who was leading that hazard process. So this is in Maryland again? Yes, this is all of the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland. Uh, again, we have the combination of high-tech and low-tech. This is Mark Bowie who discovered um, Ultima Thule. Um, making models of what he thinks it might look like with modeling clay here. <laughs> um, and then we weren't sure of the shape, so we're getting more creative with possible. At this point, we have really had no idea what it was going to look like, as you can tell. Um, it sounds like we're having too much fun. We were working as well. Um, but yeah, the, lo the local bar, bar made uh, an Ultima Thule cocktail for us, which was kind of darkish and reddish like our target and had champagne because it was New Year and so on. And this is Leslie Young, who was the co-inventor co of that. And so yeah, one of our big jobs on approach was figuring out if it was safe. So here are long exposure images that we took. Uh, showing our target in the middle, it's now nice and bright and the area around it, we're looking for any sign of debris and we just didn't see anything if you take these dashed lines off, it's just completely clean here. So at this point, about two weeks before the encounter, we, we knew it was going to be safe. It wasn't safe, we could divert, but then we'd be flying by further away and we wouldn't get such good pictures and we didn't want to do that. So when we, we finally decided it was safe and um, made the decision to stay the course we had a big celebration, everyone was very happy. This is uh, Alan Stern, who's the principal investigator, who's really the brain, this whole mission is his brainchild. And Mark Showalter, the leader of the Hazard team, and Mark Bowie again here. And Alice Bowman, who's the mission operation manager, is wearing one of our hard hats that the Hazard team had to <laughs> make sure we were safe. <laughs> And then it was Christmas and we had a nice Christmas celebration, we took a day off. It really does seem like we weren't working that hard, but we were. Um, but then this business of navigation was really consuming us at this point. Uh, here are the here's a, a real movie of images from the spacecraft. This is pretty much the raw images. This is after some processing and this is after the stars are subtracted. And here you, you can see this is our target against the star background. You now see it moving and you see the crosshairs on it. We were measuring its position incredibly precisely each time we got a new image to make sure we were heading in the right, right direction. Our cameras were going to be pointed in the right direction. And every so often we decide we need to nudge the spacecraft, change its trajectory a little bit. And those meetings got really intense and really uh, fascinating for me on the outside. Here's the navigation team and Alan and Mark Bowie. Um, we looked at a lot of diagrams like this, which were basically saying, this box is where we want the spacecraft to go. These circles are where we think it's currently going. And so you can see here it's out of the box. And this is the point where we're saying, okay, we're going to have to fire our thrusters to move our aim point into the box here. And then it might drift out again. And so we do it again. And so there's a whole lot of iterations on that. But in the end it was, it, and it was drifting for a while. We weren't sure why. And in the end, we got it so it was just rock steady in the box and it stayed there. And we, were, we knew we, were, we really had it nailed. And this whole process, I was, one of the things that fascinated me about it was Captain Cook must have been having these exact same conversations <laughs> in his cabin in the Endeavour as they were trying to find New Zealand. You know, this is where we think we are, this is where we think New Zealand is, we seem to be drifting a bit to the west, we should need to make a correction and so on. It's just the exact same game 
that we're playing to keep, keep on that tradition of exploration. And so here, finally, the last time we made a correction was two days before the encounter, because you get your best information at the last possible minute when you're closest. But then it's, not, it's six hours at the speed of light for that information to get to the Earth, six hours to send a command back. So this was really our last opportunity to make that decision with, you, with the best possible data. And it happened to be four o'clock in the morning. But, so we had to be there at four o'clock in the morning. And here we have made that decision. We're going to uplink updated positions to the spacecraft so it knows where to point. And uh, we're all very tired but very happy at this point and got a few hours sleep before we got into the encounter. And then the next day, we actually started seeing detail. Pluto had been seeing detail for months on approach because it's so big. Whereas this thing, it was only the day before we got there, we could see it as more than just a dotted light. And it wasn't too impressive, but it was very elongated. So we could, this is what you go from this to with a lot of processing to something that looks like that. But it's clearly a long, thin thing. It's not just spherical. So that was exciting. And then the next day, it looked like this. This was on New Year's Eve, so this is just a probably 24 hours before the flyby um, and now we can see it's got two bits with a thin bit in the middle and we could start we could see the size of it here and then we flew past and we were still a bit nervous because you know we'd said there was no debris there but you never know or something might have gone wrong with the spacecraft commands so the next morning january the first <laughs> we got the message back from the spacecraft that everything was fine it executed all its commands had been no errors it obviously hadn't hit anything and so we had a big celebration, and here is Simon, who's in the room right now, and uh, my wife, who wishes she could be here today, and some other friends of ours, and then just a whole room full of friends and family, very excited that the mission had been a success. But we still hadn't got any good data yet. So, but we knew that afternoon the spacecraft was going to do more than just say, hi, I'm fine, and was actually going to start sending images back. So that afternoon, um, we're in, the, in the, the science room, and each image takes about an hour to come down. And it comes down in slices. You get the bottom of the image and then more. And at this point, we were really excited because we got the bottom slice of the image, and there's this streak in it. Oops, I, oh no, there we go. Um, and this is just a camera artifact. It's like a kind of lens flare, that, but it tells you there's something in the image up here. We didn't know what it was going to look like, but we knew it was in the frame. We were targeted correctly, so we were very happy to see this. Um, and, and then again, we were playing the game. Everyone was hitting refresh like crazy to try to be the first to see that it, when it finally hit the ground. And it wasn't me this time. It was my friend Stuart Robbins at the back of the room. And everyone, he just yelled out, I got it. And everyone crow crowded around to see what he was looking at. And uh, here's the same view from the other side. And uh, here's Alan, and you can kind of see what we got here, but here he's up on the big board. And it's two objects stuck together. This is not a single object. We'd had some hints of that from the occultation work, but we didn't really know. And then here it was blindingly obvious. These are two things that form separately and glom together. Um, and the target, it was perfect. It was right in the center of the frame. All that blind pointing, all those late updates and everything, they'd all worked. Um, so we were happy. Uh, that's my best side there. <laughs> and then here was here's Mark and his best guesses, best guesses to what it might look like. And here is the real thing in silhouette behind. So. And then here is a, a little bit better view of that. Um, this image is still pretty grainy. It's kind of blurry. It's not that sharp. But these are the first look images that we got down. We knew we'd get a lot better views later. But it was enough to tell us that this was an extraordinary object like nothing we'd ever seen before. Um, and so we already knew we'd got, somehow got two objects in the outer solar system to get, come together and stick. And we were having a lot of fun waving our arms and trying to explain what was going on here and looking at all kinds of computer models people had done of objects grazing and, and not quite colliding and then coming together again and so on. Um, but, but we just had a couple of grainy images at that point, and then we all went home, and then we, the spacecraft started sending back the full data set, and it's still sending back that data set. It will be, we won't get all the bits down for another year or so. But, but we prioritize, so we get all the good stuff first. Um, 
So in, the, in January, February, March, we were getting most of the high priority data that we wanted. And so the spacecraft's using its big antenna to send the data back to the Earth, which is somewhere in here. And so one of the things we were able to do is see a mo uh, watch it rotate. Now, this is images taken on approach. And we've taken out the fact it's obviously getting bigger as we get closer, but we've removed that with the computer. So you just see it spinning. We see it getting sharper as we get closer. Um, just uh, because we're seeing more detail. And you can start to get some feel for the three-dimensional shape. We were a little bit annoyed because we did not know how it was spinning before we got there, but it turns out it's spinning with the spin axis more or less pointing straight at us, which means we only ever got to see one side. And the, the other side, we, we, we couldn't really see, though we, we had one trick I'll show you in a minute. But this gave us some idea of the three-dimensional shape of it, and instead of just that flat view. And then we were just able to get a lot of new images down. So this grainy image we started with, this is a single frame. We actually took that image 40 times. We clicked the shutter 40 times, sat down all 40 images and added them together. And that allowed us to go from this to this and get a much sharper view of what the object looks like. Um, this is the closest view of all. It's still a bit grainy. But now we can see um, very clearly the scene between the two pieces. It's got this bright. Area. And then we see craters and we see fractures and all kinds of interesting stuff up here. And something that's striking about this, it looks like it's made of bits that are glommed together. You've obviously got these two big bits. Um, but this is, seems to be made of segments as well. It's like a, the shell of a turtle or something. And so we think each of these pieces may have assembled from individual smaller pieces that came together. And then the two big ones came together and stuck. Um, and it doesn't have many craters on it. Um, if you look at the surface of the moon, it has a lot more craters than this. And that's because it's so far out in the solar system, there's just not much happening out there, and there aren't many things to run into uh, uh, objects out there, so you just don't make many craters. Yeah? So, it looks like from that picture that most of the craters are along the same axis. Well, there are some that seem to be aligned. Um, there's like a row of pits here. And these may be aligned, or it may be just the way the light is hitting them. You can only see the craters very well right here where the sun is grazing the surface. So there's actually been quite a debate about that. Are they random, which you'd expect for impact craters? Or are they from collapse or something happening in inter interior? Uh, but there aren't a lot of them. And that's just reinforcing that this is a really pristine object. This thing formed and sat there for four and a half billion years until we came to see it. And nothing much happened. Um, Question? Yeah. What started it spinning and what forces are slowing it down? Well, those are good questions. Everything, everything in the universe spins. Um, I'll show you a cartoon in a minute, but these things form from... You start in when the solar system was first forming, all you had was gas and fine particles of dust. And you had to build first things like this and then entire planets from those ingredients. And so the dust particles collide with each other and they stick and they grow into larger particles. And they, those are interacting with the gas, and the gas is swirling around, and eddies in the gas, we think, kind of concentrate this stuff. And uh, then you get bigger clumps, and then they start colliding with each other. And unless they collide exactly perfectly head on, if it's any kind of glancing below, which it almost certainly will be, those two things are going to spin after they collide. And so that's the process that is ultimately giving everything in the universe, in the solar system spin that the Earth is spinning because of how things collided with it only in its history. And, and then, um, but the slowing down thing isn't that obvious because once things start spinning, they will keep spinning at that same rate if there's no friction. And there's, you know, in space there's no friction. But this thing almost certainly was spinning faster when it first formed because these objects came together so gently they must have been orbiting each other. But if they were orbiting each other, they had to be going, we can calculate the speed, and it was faster than they're currently orbiting, uh, currently rotating. So you've got to slow them down, and we don't know quite how that happened. Um, and there it may have been friction, there may have been some gas left to slow it down. It may have been a lot of small particles that were, it was throwing around and taking momentum out of it, something like that. But we're still working on that one. This is our, our best color image. Um, it's quite red. It's, this color is probably not very accurate, but it's, it's a, quite a bright red object. And for reasons we do not understand, most of those objects out there are distinctive reddish brown. There's other objects with different colors, but all these, what we call the cold classical objects, these objects in these very circular primordial orbits, 
they're all this color. And so it's very reassuring to see that this is that color too, and therefore it does belong in that family. But there are subtle variations that don't show up too well here, but here's a region that's kind of bluish compared to the moon part. Here's a bit that's kind of more orange. The other ways look kind of similar, but there's hints that the pieces that went up to make this weren't all exactly the same. We also have composition measurements, and they show a surface that seems to have a lot of hydrocarbons. We think we've seen methanol and some water ice on the surface. And we have, uh, we have a three-dimensional view, so you can see in stereo, and I don't know if, if there's anyone here who's good at cross-eyed stereo, but this will, if you look at this with cross-eyed stereo, you get a nice feel for the shape of it. Last time I did this, I tried to use the red-blue glasses, and it really didn't work very well. So. Um, but the other way you can do is just this is just taking these two images, which are from different perspectives, and morphing between them, so you can get a feel for the three-dimensional shape. It turns out it is not two spheres stuck together. This thing is more of a pancake. Maybe you can get a feel for that. It's pretty flat, or maybe a hamburger. And then this object is kind of flat as well, so you've got two flattish objects that came together. And that was a big surprise. I mean, we really don't understand that. Um, we got another hint of the view as we took a parting shot as we went past. We see the, the night side, we see the double crescent here, and it's blurred because of the long exposures. But you see the stars in the background being winking out behind it. So that actually gives you some, few, some idea of the shape of the night side as well. So that was a really important additional clue as to the shape and confirms that it's, it's really not spheres, it's just flat a couple of flat, kind of fat, but flattish disks stuck together. And uh, this is that same image combined and then sharpened up in the computer. So that's the crescent parting view. So we think the three-dimensional shape is something like this. Originally we thought it was just two spheres. No, it's more like this shape, kind of like a walnut-shaped thing and a pancake-shaped thing stuck together. And we don't know, we don't know what the night side Reach shape is very well, so it could be somewhere between here and here, but it's not any thicker than that, we don't think. Um, so, yeah, we think that there's some eddy in the solar nebula where all these particles have come together and they're colliding with each other and making busy, bigger, bigger particles and starting to feel each other's gravity and being pulled in into this vortex. And so we think probably you end up, for reasons we don't quite understand, with two objects orbiting each other, one of which, but they're both kind of flat, one is flatter than the other, there's probably moons around them as well. And then those are somehow coming together, losing speed, and making a very gentle collision, which hardly damages either of them. You just see that bright area in, in the middle, but no other signs of any violence, it's just a little kiss, and then they stuck together for four and a half billion years. Are they actually stuck together? Um, we... They're at least resting on each other. Now, we don't know if you pulled really hard, you could yeah. pull them apart. That's a pretty hard experiment to do. But they're essentially stuck. Their gravity is enough to hold them together, even so, if they're not actually glued together. Solder or chemical reaction in there, anything like yeah. that. I mean, after 4.5 billion years, they're probably stuck pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you end up with something like this, then, of these two objects stuck together and rotating around like this. Without much damage, so they came together very gently. But the, what's really cool about this is if you want to build a planet from a bunch of dust, you've got to find a way to make small things to stick together to make large things. And we really didn't know how that process happened because it was all theory. But here, just frozen in the outer solar system, we see that process actually happening. We see these two objects coming together and sticking and showing us this is how planets were built for the first time we can see that. So this has been a very exciting discovery. Um, and just to finish off, another thing that's fun about this is you get to meet all kinds of interesting people because all, people, like, all kinds of people get interested in this and uh, one person who worked quite a lot with us is, is Brian May who is, uh, you may know as the lead guitarist for Queen and maybe you saw the movie um, but he's, he actually has a PhD in planetary sciences um, he, uh, he was working on his PhD when he started this rock band which kind of took over his life and, <laughs> But he actually went back and finished it in the 20, about 20, 2007. He went back to Imperial College London and got his PhD. And so he does a lot of science popularization work, and now he writes books. And he's really into stereo photography. He loves to make stereo images. So he's demonstrating one of his stereoscopes here with Mike Buckley, who's one of our PR people. And uh, 
but he was all very interested in combining the science with the art and and so I had a really fun time working on animation with him that would take all the images we took on approach and string them together uh, with um, a, a, a seam make a seamless movie which we didn't actually take but just filling in all the gaps in it and he provided music for it and so here's our movie and hopefully the sound will work again so this is all based on real images just with some interpolation between them and we see it emerging from the star background here as we get closer and now we start to see it rotate Yeah, so we get to explore the solar system and uh, collaborate with rock stars. <laughs> Pretty fun. So that's it. Um, happy to answer any more questions. Uh, I know there were a lot during the talk, but if anyone has anything else they've been saving up. What intended to use to receive all the data? We use the Deep Space Network, which is a series of stations around the world. There's one in California, there's one in Canberra, Australia, and there's one in Madrid, Spain. And they're spaced like that, so as the Earth rotates, there's always one pointing in the direction you want. And so they have these huge 70-meter uh, antennas, like 200-foot radio dishes, that pick up the incredible faint, incredibly faint signals from the spacecraft and transmit that back to the Applied Physics Lab, where we can turn them into pictures. Um, and uh, yeah, the spacecraft transmitter is operating on about 60 watts from 4 billion miles away. Um, these un uh, antennae can still pick it up. Yeah. Uh, is there fuel? Uh, no, we actually have quite a lot of fuel left. Um, we'll run out of power eventually because we, we, we're using a plutonium uh, radioactive heat source which is decaying with time. But we probably have another, if we really push it, 15, 20 years of power left before we can't talk to the spacecraft anymore. So we're continuing out into the furthest reaches of the solar system, continuing to see what's out there. Yeah. How far out will you be able to communicate? Well, by the time we lose communication, probably in the late, mid to late 2030s, we should probably about 100, about 100 astronomical units, about 100 times further from the Sun than, we, than the Earth is. So right now we're at 45 astronomical units. So we're only halfway out to that point. And we'll be, the solar wind <coughs> blows this bubble in the interstellar medium. The, the edge of that bubble is just somewhere out beyond 100 astronomical units, so I don't know if we'll make it to the edge of that bubble, but we'll be starting to feel the effects of that by the time we lose contact with the spacecraft. And we're going to keep talking to it and finding ways to fine tune the power and maybe get more life out of it. And who knows, we might make it all the way into interstellar space if we really are clever enough. Um, yeah, at the back. Is there an object number three? We would love to fly by an object number three. But it's getting very dark out there and pretty empty. And it's really hard to find anything that, that's, that's that far out. So we're still looking at it. We haven't given up on the idea yet. But it's going to be a tough, tough job. But we'll, if it's possible, we'll do it. Yeah. Where's Voyager? Voyager is out further. The Voyager spacecraft launched in 1977. So they got quite a head start. They're also, they didn't launch from the Earth as fast as we did. We have the record for speed of launch from Earth. But they cheated and flew past all these giant planets and picked up a lot of speed. So they're now going faster than we are. We're not going to catch up. But we're all three of us heading out in the same general direction. They're out now at about 120 astronomical units. Voyager 1 is in interstellar space. It's made it outside the solar wind. Voyager 2 looks like it's getting to that point. And we're playing catch up, like halfway out beyond them. But yeah, we're still talking to the Voyagers uh, after 40 years in space. We, they're getting pretty, it's getting pretty marginal right now, continuing to power them. They have, actually, when we were approaching 
uh, ultimately we we had to give up some communication time because one of the voyagers I was having a temperature problem they were, the, they were afraid some of the fuel was going to freeze in the lines and break a fuel line and that would be the end of the mission so they had to get an emergency command on to switch up it switch on the heater to stop that from happening so we, we gave them a few hours of deep space network time to do that um, yeah 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 um, or the error solving for the errors is that's it's all about the errors in fact it's easy to take a picture or make a measurement but figuring out how precise that measurement is is all the work is in that and so there's all kinds of ways of doing it from first principles you take a bunch of measurements and you see if you get the same answer each time or how close it is and stuff like that but for the navigation that was critically important and in fact there was a big debate because we were it seemed to be drifting off course and we eventually figured out because we didn't trust our navigation well enough the we were measuring the positions with incredible precision it, if technically it was a 40th of a pixel to measuring the position of the object relative to the stars mm. in the background and no one thought you could do that mm. so they didn't believe that so they weren't trusting the data at that level and that meant it wasn't compatible with other data but when you actually you know gave the data its full power that yes we really could measure where this thing was to a 40th of a pixel then everything f fell into place so yeah that's all the math and all the error estimation so is, is a big part of the whole thing um, yeah how did you verify the command sequences before you set them up we we have a couple of tools we have a software simulator on the ground that we do the first checks with but then we have a hardware simulator that's rep that's sitting on a rack in at the applied physics lab and just replicates all the hardware that's on the spacecraft and so we run all the critical commands through that usually in real time um, and occasionally we catch errors when we do that but um, nothing goes to this no commands go to the spacecraft before they've been tested on the on the simulators to make sure we're not it's really easy to do something dumb like there was a Russian mission um, decades ago where they were it was going to Mars and they wanted to trans switch from the uh, primary radio receiver to the backup radio receiver and so they sent up commands saying okay switch off your primary receiver okay now switch on your backup receiver <laughs> of course it never got the second command because it just switched off the receiver and they lost the spacecraft there was nothing they could do at that point so you, you, it, there is not much room for error in this business yeah does it send back pings, or how do you know it's still, like, do you have, do you have it respond every week? Um, right now, uh, we're talking to it almost every day because it's sending back all the data. Sure, sure, yeah. And we, we get typically eight hours a day uh, from one of those. And those antennae have to talk to other spacecraft as well, so we don't get all the time. Uh, but we're getting about eight hours a day, and each day we get back, um, the, the it's about, a thousand bits per second. It's 1980s dial-up modem speeds, uh, which is why it takes years to get all the data back. Um, and, but sometimes it's in hibernation, and then it just sends a ping once a week saying, "I'm fine," and uh, then we save a lot of, of deep space network time and a lot of manpower as well for running it. But right now we're busy getting data back. Yeah. It, the, the, so the question is how many days did it take the message to come back it takes about six hours so just about a quarter of a day uh, to send a message all that way so and that's but that's at the speed of light that's at 186,000 miles a second and it still takes takes six hours for that signal to get all that way um, it takes a, there's a, a radio telescope out there we were just seeing before we came in that actually bounces radio signals off the moon it's a homemade radio telescope and you can bounce a signal off the moon with it and it takes about a second for that signal to get to the moon and back so if you send up a ping it's like two seconds later ping you hear the echo but and we're six hours away at that speed so that's how big the solar system is uh, yeah since you, it doesn't know when you have telescope antenna time, does it send multiple copies of data? 
Um, occasionally, if it's really critical, but usually, we, we, we figure all that in, out in advance. We essentially tell it, OK, six hours from now, the camera antenna is going to be pointing your direction, so it's time to start talking. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, and it's all time, so by the, it may have stopped talking by the time the camera antenna picks up the signal. And you've got this packet of information just traveling through the solar system that gets picked up. And sometimes we, there are glitches on the ground, or there's a, a rainstorm or something, and you lose some data because it interrupts the radio signal. And then you can send a command back to the space camera saying, uh, can you send that bit again? And uh, we can actually get, do that turnaround. We did that last weekend. We, we lost some data, and we had it back within about three days. So we were able to very quickly retransmit it. Yeah. If you get the pictures in little segments, how long does it take to get a full picture? About an hour. Um, we, we, we can also take small like postage stamp thumbnail pictures. Uh, which come down a lot faster, but to get a full resolution image takes about an hour, maybe two sometimes. And we have various tricks we can play. Sometimes we, we know the object's just in the middle of the frame, so we just send back the middle of the picture. We don't send back the rest of it. Um, so we do a lot of that as well. But that's kind of the rate. It's, it's, uh, this is not video rates. <laughs> yeah. You're not getting Netflix from No. <laughs> yeah. Um, how about the speed of the spacecraft when approaching the object? It's 14 kilometers a second, which is about 32,000 miles an hour. So, uh, um, oh, I, yeah, I never said, did I? Um, we, we went 2,000 miles, 3,000 kilometers, or 3,500 kilometers from the target, which is Pluto we went by at about 8,000 miles, so we were four times closer to this object than we ever got to Pluto. Um, so, yeah, we were thinking right, right there at New Year's, um, the actual flyby was 33 minutes after the ball fell at Times Square. <laughs> and we were saying, boy, it's, clo it's now closer to another object than it has been since it launched and since it was 3,000 miles from the Earth or 2,000 miles from the Earth. It's, it's lonely out there. So that's as close as it's ever going to get, probably. Yeah? Um, I'm just so impressed that when you were flying by such a small object so close, and at such a high speed that the images weren't blurry. And I'm just curious how many people total were on the team working together to plan all that out and make it possible? Um, there was one person whose job it was to make sure the images weren't blurry. Um, <laughs> and she sweated bullets over that. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, some of them were deliberately blurry because um, it's dark out there and you have to scan across pretty quickly and sometimes you've got to choose you either take a really underexposed really grainy image or you take a well exposed image that's smeared you know just as like you might have that same problem with uh, using a camera in very low light here on the earth and so sometimes we had to say okay we'll just take it a little bit smeared and a little bit underexposed and we'll just try and find that sweet spot in the middle we do a lot of simulations to figure out what was the right the best compromise there but yeah sometimes we had to make compromises and not all the images are sharp and then some of them we can sharpen in the computer um there was a, a beautiful example of that back here so this one this is what the actual image looked like but it was actually fairly simple in the computer to turn it into that just to take out the blur yeah so i think you said the cameras are fixed on the side of the spacecraft, mm -hmm. so you have to predict how the spacecraft should be oriented mm -hmm. to get the object of interest. Does that mean that the antenna that is sending data back to Earth is uh, aimable, or do you no. electronically aim it? Or no, we, we, we have to choose between either taking data or sending data back. We can't do both at the same time. Uh, Just because we have to turn the antenna off Earth to uh, point the spacecraft in the right direction. Um, and so, yeah, that's just part of what we have to factor into the plan. That's why we had to wait. The spacecraft flew by midnight on New Year's uh, morning, but we didn't get a signal till um, the middle of New Year's Day because the spacecraft was too busy taking data and wasn't talking to the Earth at that time. And then it turned back, sent a quick hello, then took some more data, and then started sending back those first images. Um, so it's all part of the choreography and all the juggling you have to do 
So yeah, we have to, we, on approach, we had a break of about four hours when we couldn't take data because we were receiving those last updates from the ground as to where to point the, uh, the cameras. So we figured that was important enough that we, we could, we would, it was worth taking a break at that point. So how much data storage is on the spacecraft? It is, um, we have two data recorders and they're about eight gigabytes each, which isn't bad. We can store, we can store hundreds of images, but you know, a thumb drive has far more than that these days. I mean, of course, of course it was built in the early, yeah. it, you know, a thumb drive in 2004 when they were building it, we might have had that kind of capacity. And of course, this is you can't just stick a thumb drive in there. You, everything has to be super reliable, space qualified, radiation tested, um, everything like that. So um, I'm building a spacecraft that you can guarantee will last for 12 years in space is, is there's a whole uh, uh, big job there, just making sure things are that reliable and backed up and redundant and so What's on. What's the gold material that looks like foil? It's, it's my gold coated mylar with other things as well. It's, it's really thin. I actually, on the, a very happy moment for me on New Year's Eve, right before the encounter, a guy came up to me, introduced himself. He was one of the engineers who built the spacecraft. And he gave me a little plastic Ziploc bag with a little gold square in it. And he said, this was from the cutting room floor when we were wrapping the spacecraft. <laughs> and so here's a little piece of of, of my life, I should have brought it, I just forgot, uh, about this big, which is, could have been on the spacecraft, could have been out there right now if it had just been on the other side of that cut. Um, <laughs> so that's cool. Um, and then the moment after that, my colleague Simon tapped me on the shoulder and says, we just got the navigation data, everything's going to be pointed perfectly. So um, that was a doubly good moment. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, and it's multiple layers, and then there's, uh, there's uh, some kind of a material in between and there's some Kevlar mixed in there to, for protection against micrometeorites. So it's, it's quite high tech stuff, but its main purpose is just to keep the spacecraft warm. It's actually room temperature inside the spacecraft, even though we're out when you're at the ambient temperature is 40 degrees above absolute zero. Like here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shall we give him a little bit of a rest?